let's get started with our interesting topics today. Starting off with our first speaker, Monique Moreau, who will be talking to us about trust and intersectionality between identity, privacy, and Internet of Things. So with over 25 years of experience as a global technology leader, Monique Moreau is a senior distinguished architect for emerging technologies at Cineverse Technologies, where her main role and responsibilities is to provide thought leadership and to help the strategic direction and vision for Cineverse's identified emerging technologies across the company, partners, and the industry forum. So I'll hand over to you, Monique, and just a reminder to everybody, if you have any questions, please do post in the Q&A. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, and to the women of Digital Switzerland, it's a great honor to, to be here, um, and also uh, co-presenting with Sandra. So uh, what, uh, what a pleasure, and, and how you've uh, put this together. You know, when we're talking about cybersecurity and privacy, they actually work together, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to take it from a different angle, especially... Uh, just for the reasons that you've framed it up. Um, in the context, especially in the context, context of what's happening in our COVID-19 world, which we have to live, live with, um, I think forever. But one of the things that uh, you will have to think about is that uh, we're always going to be talking about trust. And trust is very, very important. Anybody who's listened to me before, I will actually always hone in on this particular topic that there is a correlation between trust and ethics, between trust and what you do overall. And um, there's no attribution to this, uh, to this saying, but it does, uh, you know, it is a matter of, uh, uh, you know, taking years uh, to build and, and seconds to break and forever to repair. So when trust is broken, and you can imagine how trust can be broken, um, then we have, we have to think about uh, some scenarios of how we can regain it as an industry back. In framing the conversation further, we are always pulsating with information. And this is a day, of life, a day in a life of data. It's tremendous information. So when we're thinking about surveillance in the, in the form of you know, tracking, uh, tracking of diseases, tracking of where you're at, uh, we're always in that, the middle of that. Uh, there's no doubt that when you wear a, a smartwatch or you, wear, you have your uh, mobile phone, you're actually pulsating with data. So data is huge here. And the amount of data is, is getting even greater as you can see by, by this particular uh, visual. That's exp that the, the growth is so very exponential. And it is fueled by the Internet of Things. Uh, we have smart objects, we, are, we have smart homes, we have smart cities, we have smart X, smart Y, and smart devices, and uh, everything is just information, information that gets out there. And so what happens with that information is very, very interesting. You know, who's taking that information and putting it all together for what purpose? It was always stated that data is oil or, you know, because people look at it or organizations can look at it to, to mine for specific opportunities or business opportunities. But data is pulsating at all moments and we are all doing it. So I think that's something to, to think about when we're looking at the day in life of data. But, um, and I'll take this apart a little bit because it's just not about COVID-19. It kind of takes us out of that. It is even pre-COVID-19. But there is technology that is being assembled by a few um, um, big actors here, and they're, they're very major uh, organizations and companies. And the thing of it is, is that there is no um, sense, if you will, of, of, of of regulating that, right? The regulating the big this big behavior, and to be fair to this these companies, and I want to be absolutely fair and and diplomatic here. Um, you know, there is they basically have said uh, in the press, regulate us. You know, democracy is at stake. That was Brad Smith of, of Microsoft. 
uh, regulate big tech. In fact, he wrote a book about it. He published a book in September of, of, this, of this past year, I believe. Um, Apple basically said, you know, we have a laxity of rules and, um, and from every day to the deeply personal, um, our, you know, we're, our privacy, what's happening is being weaponized against us in a very military way. And then Bill Gates said some, something of the same nature here. So it's about um, what happens with this, <clears throat> excuse me, this information that gets pulsated and who, which organizations are doing what with the information. I think this is, sets us uh, to, to think about um, what, uh, what is at stake here, especially to the bigger picture where Brad Smith basically said democracy can be at stake here. But ethics has um, also to do with um, in this pulsating of data, which is metadata of metadata, which is, um, you know, you are, something is being formulated about you. And by the way, this has always probably been the case here. We're just beginning to be cognizant of it. But something is being formulated about you. And the thing of it is, is do we care? Should we care? Or is it game over? These are questions to postulate especially during our time here, especially during this environment. Is it game over? Do we care? Should we care? Or is it over? This visual basically is from the uh, Chinese social credit system that was developed in 2014. And to be, you know, they developed that system fundamentally because uh, the premise has always been to, to look at how they would fight corruption. Um, it's a system that's been evolving over time, but it's a system that uh, in this particular context that the population is, 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 is living daily with, right? And the thing of it is, is that um, now your behavior could be credited. Do I give Sandra a credit for buying milk over buying a beer or vice versa? Does she lose a credit? And so you get into the, that level of, of um, what I would say, uh, behavioral analytics at a government level that occurs here. And do we, you know, uh, we can't criticize it so much because it depends on, 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 on the culture, on the, on the, on the values of a, of, of a com country. But is this what we are going to evolve to overall? at a global level. And that's something to, you know, to stimulate some thought and questions about. And the other component of this is also about, you know, when you're leaving digital footprints, um, you're leaving digital footprints of yourselves forever. Uh, this was a company uh, actually out of Cambridge uh, for psychometrics and it's um, applymagicsauce.com. They have actually uh, distanced themselves from Cambridge Analytica but fundamentally it's a predictions API. And the predictions API is based on your digital footprint. We could predict certain things about you, about your personality, about your political views, about your age, et cetera. And that has been in play for several years now. And so uh, you can look up uh, this kind of prediction API that is, that is out there and you know, that is uh, being used by various organizations. I think, you know, uh, what we need to think about is a digital 2.0, um, and I'm coming to a conclusion here of how we could get there. And that is around self-sovereign identity, about who owns the data. Obviously you can own the data as a consumer. It's called selective disclosures. You know, how technologies can be used to, to actually um, protect uh, your anonymity or protect your, you know, who you are, because again, it's selective, and how there could be an increased awareness about what and, and data is being used by what organizations. But again, it goes back to the earlier questions about is it game over or do we care? And self-sovereign identity is actually being out there. It's uh, it, it, there are various organizations, uh, W3C, various standards organizations, uh, companies are looking at it too, as well as uh, or, uh, you know, citizens, but companies too, in terms of what does self-disclosure uh, mean? Um, you know, how do you actually uh, have it as a persistence to you? Uh, how is it portable to you? Again, 
uh, examples of, of the, the use of self-sovereign identity to some extent can be uh, looked at in, in, in Estonia at a country level. But this is emerging quite, um, quite now. And, and I think uh, it's something that we as, as organizations and people should actually think about. Self-sovereign identity and decentralization have been go going on for many years. And uh, a colleague in the industry, industry Kalia Young, basically say it, that, and she's a, a leader in this space, that I have a way that I can create an ID, I can put it there somewhere, and nobody can really take it away from me. And these are the organizations that have been working for the past several years in this space that, um, you know, are looking at how they not only standardize on it, but against use cases, but actually look at how you can use it in the industry uh, or deploy it in the industry, but also be aware of what selective disclosure means. You know, at the end, I think we have to think about a, a citizen digital rights framework, you know, where um, how, what the attributes of that could be in terms of your data, how it could be used. Um, it's something that we should consider. Uh, these are sort of the attributes in, uh, for awareness, but it's certainly a citizen digital rights framework. And I call it a framework because it, uh, it is a framework. And you know, there, you can't force it at a jurisdictional, jurisdictional level, but something to be account, uh, you know, aware of. We need to have um, a really a multi-stakeholder approach here. We need to work with government, uh, you know, it's, I call it reg tech, regulation tech. We need to work with private industry and certainly citizen engagement is required. I think citizen engagement is great. I had personally observed fantastic citizen engagement in various hackathons that I participated in. And I have been amazed at the level of, of uh, creativity around uh, problems uh, around and solutions that have come out here. When you involve citizens to be partaking in a solution around problem sets, especially, especially uh, specific to COVID, 19, not only from, from the disease or pandemic perspective, but also from, you know, uh, how do you come out of it? What, what do we need to do from an economics perspective? What do we need to do from a societal perspective uh, has been astounding and amazing to me. And that is all. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Yes, I think it's definitely um, worth thinking about. It's, we have such a wealth of data in the world and it is honestly about the power of that data. It's the analytics that drives how we use the data, but ultimately it does come down to, as you mentioned, the ethical use of that data. We really need to be thinking about how do we allow our the, um, the providers of the data to be the true custodians of the data and make sure that the data is not misused. So it has, yes. I was gonna say, I mean, you know, and, and that's why I posed the question, especially coming out now, you know, there were various articles written in the local papers for uh, my colleague in Zurich and the NZZ uh, and so on about, you know, maybe this is a game over and, uh, you know, there is no privacy, there is no, you know, just get over it. But the thing of it is, is that you can't, we live, we struggle. I had long discussions uh, with other organizations. Uh, you don't want to be have, especially if you're living in a federal society, mm -hmm. you don't want to be force fed that this is how, what you must do. You've got to partake in that solution. You've got to partake in terms of how, you know, you want to know how your data is being used and, and you want to be able to self select uh, uh, in, in a way that is that puts you in the middle of that universe. But if you're an organization, if you're a commercial company, you absolutely want to, tr you know, track for third party, you know, where, do, where has my, my supply chain gone to and, and uh, how far can I, uh, you know, track for that for self-sovereign identity? Because things have identities. And that's the whole point here. Things, mm -hmm. your smart objects, your watches, et cetera, have identities. And so we have to be cognizant of how much information we choose to pulsate, but be aware that when you do it, you leave forensic dust out there forever. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Monique. And um, I'm seeing some really good comments coming through in the chat. We've had a couple of comments about digital citizen rights that have come through. Mm -hmm. um, a paper. Um, thank you, Gali. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right. 
Um, she has shared very kindly a paper on um, ACMDL and GDPR and the usage with blockchain. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and there's, there's definitely like, as you mentioned, Monique, there is definitely some worry, there's some concern, some anxiety among people around the world, really being cognizant of how their particular apps are being used and being aware of how the data is being used and being able to decide. So well, I, I just want to take one pause. I'm going to, uh, if, you, if I may, because I get very sure. passionate. Because, uh, one, is, one is about GDPR, absolutely cognizant of it in blockchain. I think the question to, to remain is, is a hash data? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, so you have to be aware of that. Uh, the other component is, uh, it was actually an article, a uh, colleague of mine from IBM actually put, actually re shared this item that I think it was in the MIT Tech Magazine, or it was released yesterday, where a provider in India, you know, they were using tracking and, um, the data was accidentally released mm. for, for COVID tracking, right? So the data was released and um, it was leaked out, at, I'll call it accidentally. That's why when you're talking about, oh, it's just a tracking thing, you know, but in this particular case, it was released. Mm. And so now, you know, your name, your address, and uh, so you can actually look it up. It was just uh, announced yesterday. So the, these are the things that we have to be cognizant of. Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest uh, security issues that can happen um, is how do we protect the data once it does come through, especially when it's um, personal data and health data. Yeah. How do we ensure that our cybersecurity systems are in place and being able to secure this data to prevent or reduce the risk of it being leaked through? Thank you so much, Monique. That was a Welcome. really insightful presentation. I have seen some really good questions coming through. So everybody, please keep them coming in in the Q&A box, pop in all your questions, and I will be going through them in our Q&A session coming up shortly. All right, so we have been sitting for a little bit of time. So if you, it's accessible for you right now, just stand up for about 40 seconds, just have a quick rest and stretch. I'm gonna just take a break from the screen. You can, if you want to, just twist around a little bit, stretch your arms. Oh, grab a drink or anything like that. And we'll, we'll take a seat. So we're, we are now going to move on to our second speaker for today. Sandra Tobler will be talking to us about the issues with strong customer authentication and why it's in our interest to build a strong cybersecurity ecosystem. So Sandra is an entrepreneur who worked in the IT space for many years. She's worked for IBM in various international roles since 2007. She then joined SGE and later the State Secretary of Foreign Affairs, where she built the expertise for the IT industry and consulted Swiss IT companies with internationalization. So I will go ahead and hand over to you, Sandra. And just another pleasant reminder, please put any questions that you have in the Q&A, even if they were in relation to the previous presentation, and uh, enjoy. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks, Priyanka. Good morning, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks for this really nice um, initiative um, during those times to still kind of connect to like-minded uh, people around the globe. Um, so thanks for the platform. And um, yeah, to briefly start, I will talk a bit about more the micro level of um, the larger sense identity. Um, so how it's typically lived in, in companies and also a bit my experience from the last few weeks in uh, lockdown mode um, where a lot of colleagues uh, across organizations were uh, stuck in. So, um, what has changed specifically in the context of IT security in the past few weeks? I think um, the most striking things are that attacks have increased, um, specific attacks have, have increased. Um, to mention some really um, cruel ones are targeting um, users all across, across the, the organizations, um, trying to fish and uh, they do that. They do that. Oops, can you still hear me? I have a bit of power problem here. 
Yes, Sandra, we can still hear you. You're can you audible. see me? Okay, yes, I, my screen just disappeared, but I tried to do that. Okay, um, so uh, a lot of phishing emails are circulating uh, where they have m sometimes links to malicious sites. Um, the really mean ones are directed to Center for Disease Control, uh, WHO, or the likes. Um, Sometimes they, they, the more refined ones, they want you to download malware, but really it's just also to gather sensitive information. Uh, we have seen also some very targeted attacks um, that are um, targeting health organizations, hospitals, or um, governmental bodies um, in the health area. Um, so, sorry, but this Santa, basically, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Could you Can lower you hear your screen just a tiny bit? We cannot see you very well. Just okay, I perfect. just got yeah. some technical issues here. Um, sometimes sorry, it's the band. Can no you hear worries. me? Yep, everything's good. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so. That said, um, this is not just for health organizations, but it's really um, possibly uh, targeting every single person uh, and trying to, they try to get access to sensitive information through this um, type of attacks. Um, so other challenges that uh, customers of mine were facing or are currently facing or other organizations that we are interacting are um, the following. Um, I would say, First and foremost, there's still a lot of companies that are not used to do a remote work setup. So that means um, they don't have clear processes in place. They were blocking to allow users to work from home. Um, they have applications that can only be accessed in the on-premise, like from, from the local services, from so servers, from the organization. So a lot of like, um, like they're not ready um, for digital setup to allow uh, users or, or employees to work from home. Um, then also another area that we have seen and I'm experiencing a lot is uh, bandwidth issues. So colleagues that have um, the possibility to work from home, uh, companies assume that they have a really good uh, setup remote. I mean, apart from let's say social um, issues that might occur, like here in Switzerland, a lot of uh, the parents um, are struggling with homeschooling because um, schools are not set up to, to teach over um, digital channels. So um, apart from that, the really technical challenges that um, individuals were struggling to have enough bandwidth to, to do video calls and whatnot. Um, other topics that I came across were um, data privacy related. Um, so that, for instance, um, Wi-Fi networks are not secured and there are no processes in place that companies can validate or check that and that there are, for instance, password policies in place and whatnot. Um, then also bring your own device is a big topic um, that a lot of companies were not able to uh, equip all employees with devices that um, they might have desktop in the office, but they were, they were not um, equipped at home with anything that they could work with. And so they, they swiftly had to change into a bring your own device uh, area, which is again um, causing some topics in security, of course, um, since you have all of a sudden um, various devices uh, that you cannot control um, that get access to sensitive company assets. Um, video conferencing, a big debated topic. Um, we are using Zoom. Um, of course, there were a lot of uh, debates about the privacy uh, topics around Zoom. Um, I've typically a lot of time I'm investing with customers to go into production, that they validate our security, our, they do pen testing on our products, um, like they go to the very granular detail to, to whitelist us. All of a sudden, we see the same type of management um, boards just waving through tools that they don't really know uh, what type of um, privacy policies that they're um, signing up for, uh, which is again a, a big topic for especially the security responsibles of the companies. Um, yeah, but then last but not least, like one of the major issues is that typically a lot of companies, if small or big, then they're not equipped uh, with enough support in IT. So they don't have um, either the knowledge or um, someone who can really take care of all these on-site, uh, this, this remote support requests across the organization from, from users and um, uh, other uh, stakeholders. So um, 
what does need to happen uh, to make remote working more let's say um, professional also in the in the context of, of IT security um, so this is just a, a set of, of absolute must-haves in in many areas and we also saw that companies were very quickly reacting and building those structures and and um, processes um, so again it's important to have an idea about uh, what are the policies what you allow uh, when you want your uh, team members and colleagues to work from home uh, bring your own devices how to deal with this you need to have a, ki a kind of a, a guideline um, how to deal with devices that are not corporate devices um, if you can manage those devices um, through through the infrastructure or if, if you can set this up at least over time um, so to secure remote desktops of course um, the whole cloud deployment is a big topic that gained a lot of momentum I saw and I hear from a lot of um, customers we work with and then um, the other area what I what I initially said a lot of people are targeted by by phishing emails and whatnot so um, education is also very important especially these days where people are sometimes inclined to click on on things that come from a seemingly official body that are related to statistics or data uh, related to the COVID-19 um, situation. So people are sometimes more inclined to click on things that they would most probably otherwise see red flags. Um, and this is, of course, exactly the pattern that, that hackers use to get you and um, to, to reveal sensitive information or to let you click on something. Um, backup recovery for um, home devices. So you want to make sure really that you have everything um, set also in the uh, situation of an issue. And last but not least, uh, of course, uh, my major topic, it's a strong password and authentication and that across all the different applications of an organization. So that if there is any password issue, uh, password a username combination that is leaked, that you still have adequate protection on top um, to make sure that um, sensitive uh, company assets are not um, jeopardized or in any way intercepted. So this brings me to my specific topics that I spend a lot of time on, um, which is strong user authentication. So. The big topic um, that we are all aware of is that username password details is, is you, you have to assume it's public information. Um, I inserted a link here where you can check specifically applications. Um, there was the major LinkedIn breach a few years back where username passwords were revealed. Of course, the main issue is that we all use, um, or a lot of people use the same passwords for different applications. Um, they use simple passwords and um, again if they're once revealed and leaked in an application if you use the same password for other applications it's game over um, so this is the reason why we use things like um, authentication on top and um, the other major area um, and um, we have briefly discussed during Monique's presentation GDPR which changed quite a bit at least in the European Union but the problem is once organizations are affected by data breaches, um, oftentimes it happens that um, the PR department says, yeah, well, it was not so imp such important data that was affected. So, I mean, what is then not so important? Is it an email address? Is it uh, your identification? Um, a social security number is it what is not important i mean um in my view every single data set is extremely important because a hacker can generate money and as soon as a hacker can generate money of something um it is valuable data which has to be protected adequately um and again this is a major major um perception flaw that still a lot of people and organizations um have um to add to this, it's also, it's not that uh, we can imagine, it's not just a single person in a basement that tries to get hold of, of your data and is interested in your maybe account statement or your health track record or your, your health record, but um, they can integrate data and they, can, um, they don't do that manually. They, 
build algorithms to basically just feed with, with um, databases of data sets that they gathered. And um, doing that all of a sudden makes um, data even more valuable because uh, you can in the end generate entire identities um, uh, as we, we would say. And um, to protect that, to add a layer of protection to logins, which are the ones that are very um, vulnerable to access from, from outside um, to so-called large-scale attacks, we add something like two-factor authentication. Now, two-factor authentication is um, typically something that you would um, perceive as cumbersome. Um, think of your, again, social media accounts. Uh, when you add a second factor, you have to enter a code uh, via SMS or whatnot. So um, as little as 10% of the users do typically enable um, two-factor authentication when it's not mandatory. Um, and again, the major reason why they don't enable it, although it's everyone knows it's kind of something uh, that makes sense, is uh, because of usability. Um, so the people that do enable it, it's, they're really motivated by privacy concerns. And when we, again, translate this into companies, by, they also have struggles with, with such technologies. And mainly because um, they're cumbersome. Um, everyone talks about customer experience and user um, front-end um, personalized services. So it's, it's a big issue because it kind of in, interrupts those um, touch points with the user um, out of our experience. Then we have old solutions in, that are still very dominant in the market. Um, the SMS authentication, where you get Mton, so-called Mton on your phone, you enter a code. Um, those solutions have major flaws, and um, this was uh, by the NIST, which is an international standardization body. They have already released papers where they would recommend not to use such solutions. Um, that was um, a few years back. Um, the problem there is it's not just that you can have um, near um, attacks where basically through so-called sniffer, you can collect all the SMSs that come, but you can really also have scalable attacks on a global level because the infrastructure that is used to um, disseminate those messages, it's not made for security. So these, these are telecommunication infrastructures that are not made and thought of um, to be used for something like um, security codes. And they can, they're not, uh, you don't have to authenticate to those. So so depending on the operator, but even if you're traveling and um, the, SM the messages are sent across various touch points and operators, uh, these are potential areas where um, they can inter be intercepted on a, a larger scale. Um, in addition, if you grant access to other apps that um, can get hold of your security code, that's also something that ha can happen on your phone uh, that you might not be aware of where um, maliciously intended uh, people can get hold of your security code or trying to social engineer you to enter those codes to get access to your login information. So not secure and cumbersome. There are other authentication methods that um, kind of gain attention on an international level. Now, these are technologies that can be used for various things. I'm not talking really for authentication, but um, for m various reasons for authentications, they have limitations. Um, let me give you some ideas. Behavior topics um, can be something that identifies you as a user uniquely through your behavior, how you type, how you walk. It can be a really a traits of your behavior that can be associated um, with you and then can grant you access. Um, there the issue is that on the one hand side, you can spoof those. Um, you need a lot of training data to create um, pattern to create a, a model for you specifically that works, and this um, is also prone for for mistakes and um, can have false positives. Um, that also for a security solution makes it difficult to use something like that at this stage with the maturity that we have in place. Um, there are technologies I'm often asked, why don't you just use iris scan or reti retina scan? Um, these are typically interesting technologies, maybe for physical access or something. Um, today, 
the phones don't have high quality sensors yet and they're also expensive so for a mass market for authentication um, of the user to, to web uh, difficult uh, voice print a big topic um, again voice is very interesting in, in some areas um, to be used for authentication it has major limitations um, in my view uh, which is again the training data you need to generate uh, you need to build a voice print first, which is prone to mistakes. But then, um, first and foremost, biggest issue I see with this uh, from a privacy perspective is that you can fake every voice. So uh, with machine learning, it becomes way more refined to you have seen um, deep fakes online where you can create every voice basically artificially. So for a security purpose, not something um, I think makes sense, although it's, it's oftentimes hyped. Um, last example is fingerprint and face ID. Um, these are uh, perfectly fine methods to use complementary on the device only through the operating system. Uh, so in addition to other means of authentication, but solely and especially um, like centrally keeping those data in a central database to implement it for your for your um, office access, um, your um, desktop access and have those data somewhere centrally. It's a super bad idea. But trust me, um, there is nothing I have not seen yet um, with, with companies, also big companies. Um, luckily, GDPR does now um, not allow such things anymore. Uh, so even companies that try to kind of do virtual desktop authentication for employees with their face uh, were forced to um, to stop those projects uh, because again it's it's extremely sensitive and instead of securing you as organization and as a user it actually makes you more exposed to potential hackers because again um, biometric information is a value um, and can bring a lot of value for hackers once they have a database uh, with those information. So let me speed up a bit. Um, so what can we do when we when passwords are leaked? Um, of course, we do password reset. Um, now, what do we do if a biometric information is leaked? That's the big question. Um, that's a, actually currently the unsolved question when using solely and relying solely on biometrics. Um, there is nothing you can do about it. So it's really game over. Um, so this is again um, one major limitation, this non-revocability of biometrics, why it's actually not a smart thing to only rely on biometrics and it's a very sensitive thing. So while for the fingers you might have um, 10 attempts, um, for the face it gets a bit more costly and um, complicated. Five minutes, Sandra. Um, uh, replace um, those data sets. So um, um, the other area that is very sensitive, and we heard it um, with the example of India before from Monique, um, is again, we have seen examples with Adahar, which is uh, the national identity of India. They had fingerprints for illiterate people uh, that were used to identify them uniquely. They have major security issues, how they secure those. So um, again, it's all depending on how properly the architecture is done and to, to use such technologies but um, in a nutshell it can be a, a big issue if someone doesn't do a proper job and uses it it's basically also game over for all the other organizations that have such technologies in place and especially the ones that uh, solely rely on uh, biometric information now um, this is our area of uh, research where we have started uh, first at eth zurich and then um, over the last now almost four years we have built a startup uh, that is constantly looking into how um, end user authentication is evolving and uh, we do that for both web and mobile so we try to add new technologies um, constantly to our portfolio how to seemingly uh, get access to both web and mobile um, we do that um, as a service and we do that now in the meantime, not only via software, we also have hardware products in place because again, for us, it's important that we can serve any type of user, even the one that sits in a, in a, in a mountain kind of um, 
cave and needs to um, protect a data center or something. So we have really use cases that are uh, fairly peculiar, but for us it's important that we can serve every single user in a secure way uh, out of one uh, REST API. Then um, we have more uh, novel technologies. Uh, for us, it's really important that we can also use technology for users that are maybe um, impeded um, because they're visually impaired and they can't type in things. So that's another area we, we invest a lot of time in. And this is adoptive authentication that is um, basically a rule-based engine where we try to give seamless access without having to do a lot of interaction. Um, to the user and um, allowing still a high level of security. So for us, it's important to have this modular solution where we can always plug and play for a specific use case, uh, the solution that works best. Uh, another area of expertise where we always look into is um, where authentication typically causes most issues for companies. And uh, this is typically when uh, users get new smartphones if we talk about the software-based solution so uh, when new smartphones come out to the market you have to reactivate services and this causes a lot of friction uh, with more traditional solutions so we try to uh, innovate in those areas um, that are typically very costly for users uh, with novel approaches um, uh, the other last thing to mention that is important is um, to put yourself always in the sh shoes of the user when designing an architecture. So while um, I'm a bank customer, I might have a login for my mobile banking, maybe I use a web banking, and then I have a customer portal, and then I need to call the help desk. So for us, it's important to think holistically, because typically big organizations, they always have a product owner and they only think in their silos. So we always look holistically and try to find out if there is a way to secure a user with the same security token across those different products and um, life cycles. Yeah, so um, in authentication, I think the things to keep in mind is um, it's not one fits all. So while, um, to give you an example, um, scanning a QR code for logging in can be a perfectly um, solid solution for an end user application. So where you get access to a portal, um, where it authenticates you to, to um, get hold of a transaction or to sign off a transaction. But um, signing a QR code maybe doesn't make sense so much, uh, scanning a QR code inside a company. So um, you don't want to typically have employees with the smartphone in front of a screen taking pictures. Um, so it's, it's also very much depending on the behavior you want to foster um, or um, the security that it brings. So it's not just the technology um, that gives you security, but also um, the behavior you're incentivized to do or you inhibit with, with the technology. Um, and then for us, it's very important to be also fast. Um, that's why we have a very close interaction with customers because uh, things change tremendously quick. And um, everyone who has worked in IT, who knows IT, knows that a lot of uh, software that is still used in companies is very slow in um, being able to change. So legacy software typically needs an upfront um, planning, uh, you need to have a roadmap and take into account um, dependencies and then one or two years later you can go into production with the update. So um, this is not something that works anymore to secure applications and platforms. So you need to be super quick. Um, so you need to basically uh, be able to instantly react and iterate over, over topics. And that's also another area where we think a SaaS deployment can bring tremendous amount of speed and also this exchange uh, with uh, customers in this respect. So yeah, with that said, um, this is um, my founder team and we have been around for a few years now, uh, mostly in highly regulated markets across um, Europe. We have a few uh, outliers from Southeast Asia and America, but um, the large, largest amount of customers are in financial services we have today or insurance or health. Um, now, as we have nicely heard from Monique before, I think trust is the new uh, digital way of, um, trust is, is, is a brand that is becoming more and more important for co consumer across all the different verticals. Now, since we 
move, especially in the times of COVID-19, more and more services to digital channels, as the trust also needs to be translated into a digital trust. Um, now, a lot of organizations don't have so much knowledge about um, security, privacy topics, and um, for that reason, even more so, it's extremely important to gather yourself with the right talent that can help you. And um, typically it's difficult to hire good IT security people. Um, now, um, my call for action is um, not just to think of um, creating jobs for, um, to, uh, for, for IT security specialists, but really also look for different type of models of collaborating and uh, lock talent into your, your ecosystem. Um, and that you can do, for instance, with startups. Um, in Switzerland, we have the privilege to have an amazing amount of super interesting IT security companies that came out of either industry or um, the university environments. And typically these are uh, strong know-how owners in one specific area. Um, now these are all super motivated, um, state-of-the-art knowledge owner you can bring on board um, for specific problems. Um, they're again typically very agile in, in um, taking on challenges and help you also in a business environment. So my call for action is really we need this environment, we need this ecosystem. I think everyone also in, in other countries that, that you're currently in, it's extremely important to foster the startup ecosystem because that's the area where they're close to what's going on right now. Because again, legacy organizations sometimes struggle um, to on the one hand side find um, talent, but then also to um, have the specific knowledge in, in an area. And so with that, um, I'd like to close and thank you very much for your attention and I'm curious for our further exchange. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was really interesting. And absolutely, you've, um, put, you've definitely hit the nail on the head by saying that it's not just about hiring security professionals, it's about embedding the behavior and the, and the, um, the way they integrate together in the business in being able to protect and secure the assets of the company and also being able to work in an integrated manner with all the different applications that are being used in the company to produce their services. So really, really wonderful. And um, just a small comment on that very last slide you put there about the Switzerland startups and cybersecurity, I think was extremely impressive and really admirable. I'm from Australia and um, we really don't have a lot of startups. I don't think that's a culture there at the moment. So um, I will definitely, um, yeah, encourage people um, to think about cybersecurity from different angles. And yeah, definitely your Thanks. point on, yeah, two-factor authentication, I think is, um, it's a real challenge because as you mentioned, there are companies who feel this frustration, um, how to go about accessing the particular application for their purposes. So um, really well explained. Um, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, and as I'd like to mention again, everybody, please do keep, keep posting some questions. I'm seeing some great questions coming through in the chat as well as in the Q&A. And um, if you have any other questions, please do continue putting them in the Q&A. Uh, Sandra, do you have any other closing notes that you'd like to add before we move on? Um, no, maybe just to add to what you just said. I think a startup ecosystem now um, in cybersecurity, but also beyond is extremely valuable. And especially in times of COVID-19 is sometimes forgotten um, how long it takes to build um, a ecosystem. And it's also a bit depending on the culture, how um, people are likely to work with startups. So uh, in Switzerland, for instance, it's not such a culture that is used to um, onboard um, startups maybe as the logic first uh, partner for topics versus in, in Israel or in other places, it's very common that um, organizations are proud of what is locally grown and uh, they try to reach out to, to knowledge stakeholders. And I think it's something that everyone can just benefit from because you can, again, it's not just the technology, but it's really also, um, you can learn from methods, from the mindset and how to iterate on technology and uh, pick brains really on, on certain matters.